Hi, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today, I'm going to be talking about a subject near and dear to my heart. What is an industrial engineer? It sounds so generic and yet somehow very technical. So what are the benefits of industrial engineering? Why do industrial engineers even exist? Well, industrial engineers strive to improve the efficiency of systems by reducing waste. It's as simple as that. Everything they do is about increasing efficiency, productivity, and decreasing waste. Industrial engineers can really only exist in large scales, though. Think about when you're efficient at home. Maybe you make a better filing system, or you rearrange your kitchen. It might save you a few seconds here and there, but it's really for peace of mind. But in industry, when you're making thousands or millions of products, saving a few seconds here and there adds up to hours saved every day, every week, every year. This becomes real money. That's the benefit of industrial engineering. Taking your inputs, improving the process they go through so that you get more output with less input. And you see on that diagram there, losses at the bottom. If you can minimize that as well, it helps you increase your output. Ideally, any smart company would keep hiring industrial engineers until they no longer paid for themselves. The whole point of an industrial engineer is to save a company more money than it costs to pay that industrial engineer. A good industrial engineer can financially show their worth. They can document what they do and show how it's saving money. At that point, though, it becomes about the controls at the company. A good industrial engineer can only show a company the way to go. The company has to commit and actually put those improvements into place. What industrial engineers do isn't necessarily as tangible as other engineers. We're not usually designing parts or wiring circuits, but we have value. There's a story I learned when I was in school for industrial engineering about a company needing a machine to be repaired. They hire someone to come and repair the machine. All the person does is listen to the machine draw an X on a certain spot, and then hit it with a wrench. The machine starts working again miraculously. The repair technician says that will be $10,000. The company is very distraught. They say, $10,000? All you did was listen to the machine and hit it with a wrench. We could have hit it with a wrench. Well, true, says the repair technician, but you tried to repair this machine yourself and you couldn't. You didn't have the knowledge. It was $1 for me to hit the machine, $9,999 for me to have the knowledge to know where to draw the X. This helps illustrate the idea that knowledge is power. But more so than that, it's not the physical process that has the value. It's the mindset and the ideas behind it that give it value. Putting these processes into place just requires good management and good controls but you have to study the system and think of how to put these things into place first, thus industrial engineering. They may not do much physically or anything that you can see with the naked eye, but they think of more efficient systems. What are some of the tools that an industrial engineer will use to improve systems? Well, lucky for you, I have videos on most of these. Industrial engineers will use process mapping to look at the basic flow of a system, They'll use time and motion studies to understand how long each step takes and some of the motions involved. Similar to time and motion studies, you have tack time calculations, how long it takes to get a part out in order to meet customer requirements. Spaghetti diagrams look at motion specifically. Industrial engineers will also do work sampling to understand what percentage of the time someone is working, walking, taking a break, etc. They will generate work instructions that document exactly how to do a process, super useful for conforming to quality standards and for training new employees. Industrial engineers will focus on failure modes and the effects of these failures and analyze them so that they can be ranked and prevented. Industrial engineers will use basic statistics for most of these tools. And above all else, it's always good to have common sense, of course. But how common is common sense? You'd be surprised how often you see out in the field companies doing things that don't really seem like they make sense. And when you step back and take a break, you realize there is a better way to do things, a more obvious way. 
So people say that you either have common sense or you don't, but the good news is you can learn to think more critically, especially if you use a lot of these tools. You can learn to have more common sense. So where does industrial engineering even come from? It kind of seems like an odd thing to have people devoted to improving systems through tools like mentioned previously. Well, it is widely accepted that industrial engineering really began with the Industrial Revolution. Of course, like mentioned before, the benefits of industrial engineering improve as you produce more things. So as economies of scale developed, the ideas of having a production system and centralized manufacturing were born. Before you have a lot of people working in a central location, you don't really need a production system because it would just be one person or a small family making a few handcrafted items. They don't need a set system to do that. They've been doing it their whole lives. They were experts at making that single thing or few single things. But then you had the idea of interchangeable parts. They were shown to be feasible as proven by Eli Whitney and Simon North. What's an interchangeable part? Well, that's the idea that you could have a gun or another item and you could actually switch a part out and it would still work. You wouldn't have to handcraft everything at once and then have your gun and if something broke you were doomed. You could actually make individual pieces to such a high level of precision that you could switch parts out and the item would still function. This means you don't need a super skilled gun maker or wheel maker you can have a bunch of different people just focus on making their one part. It takes a lot less time to learn how to make one part and they can make that one part just as well as an expert if they train for a little while on it. This leads to less skilled workers being needed. Think about the assembly line you might have studied when in school. You have a bunch of people each just focusing on one part of making a Ford car. These people were easily replaceable because it didn't take that long to train them. They were only working on one or two machines and doing one simple thing. Putting something here, pulling a lever. Moving something, hitting something, pushing something. Very basic, easy processes. But if you break out a complex item into a bunch of smaller pieces and have a bunch of people each make those smaller pieces to a certain level of quality, when you put it all together, you still have a functional product interchangeable parts. You don't need one or two skilled artisans. You can just have 200 people off the street with a low skill level and low training make the same item, but in mass quantities. So who are some of the notable figures in industrial engineering? Well, you have Frederick Taylor, generally considered the father of industrial engineering, due to his publications focused on creating standard work using something called the scientific management method to study processes and reduce their time. Time and motion studies come back to his idea of scientific management. If you can measure it, you can manage it. Then you have Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. They help define human movement into several basic motions. We call these motions Thurbligs, which is actually kind of like Gilbreth backwards. Once you can define the complexity of human motion into several basic movements, you can begin to define what workers do in manufacturing with a set of simple terms. Reach, grab, grasp, things like that. This was also the beginning of ergonomics. As we began to study how people move, we began to notice that certain movements are better and certain movements actually cause injuries over time, if not done properly. And of course, Henry Ford. Famous for popularizing the assembly line, taking that idea of interchangeable parts and using a less skilled workforce to mass produce quality items. Modern day industrial engineering really sees its roots in World War II. Something called total quality management methods began gaining popularity in the 1940s and were especially critical to Japan's recovery from the war. You have another important figure in industrial engineering, Edwards Deming, was part of this recovery effort in Japan. He's frequently just called Deming, though. Deming is probably best known for his 14 key principles for managers to use to help transform a company. Deming's 14 points is what they're often called. 
you can see that Japan really began to get good at manufacturing following World War II and into the 80s and 90s. You probably hear from a lot of people that they used to really love American cars, and Japanese cars were kind of considered a joke. While initially American cars were a lot better, the Japanese manufacturing industry really started adopting a lot of these quality principles, and because of that, Cars like Honda and Toyota started selling and performing very well in the United States because they were able to improve the quality drastically. The U.S. lagged a little bit behind, but of course we caught on, and now today, any automotive manufacturer in the U.S. will follow a lot of these quality principles. In the 60s and 70s, we began to see a focus on materials resource planning and how all the timing issues of manufacturing supply and process need thorough analysis. So it wasn't just focused on the plant anymore. It was where are you going to get your materials? Are they going to arrive in time? Are you sourcing them from reliable sources? Do you have backup suppliers? This trend continued on, and in modern times, it, there's really been a focus on supply chain management and handling the constraints involved. So that's what industrial engineering is and where it came from. But what does the future hold? How do we prepare for the world of tomorrow? Well, looking at the trends of the past and some trends that are catching on now, really it's automation and artificial intelligence. These are transforming the world around us very dramatically. So similar to how interchangeable parts allowed for less skilled workers, automated machines and artificially intelligent systems will allow for less human workers over time. We're already starting to see examples of this. Think about fast food ordering apps where you put in everything you want, or you put in the coffee drink you want, and then it's already made when you show up. Yes, most of the time it's still a human making it, but they don't have to take your order anymore. Part of their job is already being replaced by a machine. And there's some restaurants and some coffee stands where you place the order and it's a machine making your item for you. And we see automation and AI in other areas, areas that even 20 years ago we wouldn't have guessed a robot could be doing. Think about autonomous vehicles. You barely heard about them 10 or 15 years ago. Yet today, you hear about large companies using them already in trial phases. Eventually, semi-trucks, transportation, that's going to be autonomous vehicles. CGP Grey has a great video on this titled Humans Need Not Apply. Even white collar and jobs we traditionally thought required more skilled workers are going to be replaced by AI. So regardless of how you feel about it politically, it's coming. Unions can't stop it, and there has to be some sort of solution we reach together, no matter what that solution is. So industrial engineers of the future will likely have to work more closely with automation engineers if they aren't completely replaced by automation engineers in the first place. They have to focus on how to make machines more efficient. Already today, we're beginning to see that industrial engineers half the time focus on helping humans and machines interface more effectively, whether that's ergonomic tools, work instructions that appear on a video screen, CNC training so that the workers can become more effective. As humans are replaced by robots, industrial engineers are going to focus on improving those robots. So we see the people element changing to the machine element, but this was already the main goal for industrial engineers anyway. Think about Thurblig's and standard work. We're trying to make human work repeatable and standardized. Guess what is like that already? A machine. So is it for you? Should you become an industrial engineer? Well, industrial engineers are generally those who are interested in the process of how something is done. Do you enjoy using basic statistics and mathematics to analyze group dynamics and process times? Okay, you might not know the answer to that. That sounds really complex. But let's think about a simple example. Have you ever been in a line and found yourself calculating how long your wait is going to take based on how quickly you see people being served? Even just a rough estimate. You're at a fast food place and you think, hmm, eight people ahead of me, each person's taking about a minute and a half, so maybe about 12 minutes before I'm up. Well, that is just how industrial engineers think. You're looking at everything like a system with components involved, whether it's movement, time, or anything else. These kind of things catch your eye. Even better, do you begin to think of ways to improve the system? Let's go back to that long fast food line. Do you think, why don't they open a second register? Or why don't they have some sort of express lane? Or why don't they have two people working? I see someone mopping right now. That's not the best use of their time. Well, if you think things like that, you already have the heart of an industrial engineer. 
In practice, though, industrial engineers generally work in areas with names such as process improvement, quality control, quality assurance, and production supervision. Do you find yourself enjoying computer-aided design and mechanical analysis, but only as a means to an end? You think more about, how are we going to use this thing, and what is that going to look like? That's a similar mindset to an industrial engineer. Or, do you enjoy television programs that show how items are manufactured? When someone like me who has worked in industrial engineering and manufacturing sees shows like that, I find them very fascinating, but they also remind me of places I've worked. So if you think that's interesting, you can probably get a job in a place like that. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now understand what industrial engineers are, how they think, and some of the tools they use, and why they are different than other types of engineering. If you were interested in some of the tools that industrial engineers use, you're in luck because I have videos on most of those tools. And if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, feel free to subscribe to my channel. Have a great day!